Hi everybody, so obviously I'm not in today. Uh, we are going to introduce the topics uh, that we're going to discuss in more depth uh, on Thursday and Friday today uh, through the virtual lecture. A couple of reminders before we start. Uh, please don't forget your chapter 14 notes are due on Thursday or Friday, depending on when you have class. And secondly, uh, please make sure to bring your Chromebooks uh, either tomorrow or Friday because the lesson that we're going to be doing is housed completely online and you're going to kind of need that. So uh, this is going to begin our conversation as we lead up to the Civil War. And uh, this lecture is called The Causes of the Civil War, but we know um, that the Civil War uh, only has one cause, uh, and that cause is slavery. And this is something that, for whatever reason, uh, whether it be Confederate apologists or uh, people somehow politicizing the Civil War, um, there is only one reason the Civil War was fought, and that is over slavery. All of the causes that we're going to look at that uh, go all the way back and you know until the Constitutional Convention was uh, held uh, have slavery at its root, uh, and we're going to look at the post 1849 causes today. So these are the causes that happened uh, after the Mexican American War, after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, where the United States gets the the uh, entire northern portion of Mexico's territory. But make no mistake, there is no other cause of the Civil War that is more important uh, than slavery. It is the primary cause. And what you guys are going to hear uh, in a second is uh, a perspective offered by Professor Edward Ayers uh, at the University of Richmond. And he talks about how slavery is the, <laughs> the real cause of the Civil War, but uh, offers some um, suggestions as to um, how, how deeply slavery permeated American society and uh, why it is the cause of uh, the event that tore the country apart between 1861 to 1865. So go ahead and give this a watch, and uh, we'll talk about more after that. What caused the Civil War? Boy, I tell you, that's a topic that we've argued about ever since the time of the war itself. The single word answer has to be slavery. But ever since the time of the war itself, we've war argued over just how it was slavery. Lincoln says it was somehow the cause of the war. And it's that somehow that's been at the heart of this mystery. I think the somehow is that you have to pull the camera back and see how slavery is entangled in the fundamental structures of government, of economy, and of communication. Slavery has been around for a long time. Why does it become a problem? an insurmountable problem when it does. It becomes an insurmountable problem when it does when the American population is so politically mobilized, virtually every white man is voting, and slavery becomes an object of contention. It becomes an issue that cannot be avoided when the telegraph and daily newspapers spread across the entire nation. So you're reading about slavery every day and things that are said in Congress are carried all over the country. You can't just get away with playing off one side depending where you live. And it becomes a part of the very fabric of the American economy. 80% of all American exports are produced by slavery. The North feels it's got to find some way to contain the spread of slavery or it's going to consume the entire nation. So those problems churn away through decades and finally a new party, the Republican Party, emerges to articulate the interests of the white North and when that happens the conflict really cannot be avoided any longer. Nobody believes it's going to lead to the civil war that actually occurs with the equivalent of six million people today being killed but people do believe now the time has come to confront these issues for once and for all. All right so now that we've heard Professor Ayer's perspective which we are going to explore more in depth when I see you on Thursday. We are going to look at um, some secondary causes of the Civil War as well as some events that kind of uh, really prove to be uh, exemplars for why slavery is the reason the Civil War was fought. Uh, so the first one is uh, sectionalism. And what I'd like you to do right now is uh, please go ahead and write the definition of uh, sectionalism um, as I am explaining kind of what it is. And if people need more time uh, to get that definition down, if our substitute teacher wouldn't mind uh, pausing the video uh, after I'm done with my explanation. So as it says up there, sectionalism is loyalty or support of a particular region or section of the nation uh, rather than the U.S. as a whole. Even uh, by the 1850s, people did not see themselves as Americans. Uh, they saw themselves as Virginians or New Yorkers. Uh, it really wasn't until after the Civil War that this idea of American kind of came uh, into play. Um, and what divides these uh, three regions, the North, the South, and the West, um, 
among other things. Uh, obviously, the North is an extremely industrial country, uh, part of the country. You have a massive amount of European immigrants coming in, providing cheap labor. Uh, it's where you see the country's largest cities. And this is where the Industrial Revolution in the United States is really starting to explode. Uh, the South, on the other hand, we know has centered all of its uh, economy, at least by 1850, around King Cotton. Uh, when 75% of the world's cotton comes from the American South, it is an extremely profitable industry, uh, which is driven by slavery. And slavery allows it to be so profitable. And then you have the West. Uh, the West is being settled sporadically uh, during the 1850s. And the question that comes into play here, the West, they primarily, uh, in terms of business, invest in either minerals, uh, mining, or transportation, which makes sense. Um, but really the issue that divides all these three regions is slavery. The North, for the most part, is against slavery, doesn't want it to spread anywhere. The South is obviously for the spreading of slavery because it's so linked to their economy. The West is unsure. Uh, we have the Missouri Compromise Line, uh, which says, okay, well, the territory that's below the 3630 line is slave, any territory above it is free. But uh, the conversation starts uh, actually when uh, California becomes a state and the West goes back and forth over whether or not uh, slavery should be allowed to expand into that territory or not. So sectionalism, it's this idea that instead of one country, uh, you basically have three. Certainly two with the North and the South being almost polar opposites of each other in many ways. So if you need more time to get that definition down, if our substitute teacher would pause the video now, Otherwise, I'll go ahead and continue. So this image that you see in front of you uh, happens in 1856, and it happens on the floor of the United States Senate. Uh, we all know that our uh, current uh, Congress is very divided in many ways, but certainly we haven't seen, thankfully, violence erupt on the Senate floor. And uh, the person that you see there on the ground holding uh, his quill pen is uh, Charles Sumner of Massachusetts. And uh, the person, the faceless image that you see there of a person with a cane is uh, South Carolinian uh, Preston Brooks, both of them members of Congress. And uh, this is set against the backdrop of Bleeding Kansas, which we're going to talk about later. But basically, Charles Sumner is making a speech. He is an ardent uh, abolitionist, uh, believes slavery is one of the great evils uh, in the world. And he calls out the Southerners for um, their hypocrisy and their cowardice. And as he's doing so, he calls out particularly the relative of Preston Brooks. And he even makes fun of uh, Brooks himself, who had suffered a stroke you know, six, or, six to eight months prior and had a bit of a speech impediment as a result. Uh, not exactly what you consider classy by any means. Uh, but he really went all out against kind of the Southerners and their pro-slavery argument. Uh, two days later, after Brooks heard about this, he walked into the uh, chamber of the Senate, walked up to Brooks, didn't say a word, and began beating him over the head uh, with a walking stick cane. Now, to give you an idea of what the thickness would be, um, imagine like a thin baseball bat. And he hit Brooks, excuse me, Brooks hit Sumner so many times uh, that it temporarily blinded Sumner. Uh, he was bloodied. He was knocked out. The cane actually shattered, uh, and Brooks continued his assault. Now, you're probably wondering, like, okay, well, what are the other, like, members of Congress doing while this beatdown is occurring? Uh, many of them are trying to intervene, but many of uh, the Southern supporters basically were trying to let the two fight it out. Not much of a fight when somebody sucker punches you with a cane. Uh, many of those Southerners had guns drawn, basically telling everybody else to get back. Now, these are guns drawn in the United States uh, Senate. That's pretty uh, remarkable. And uh, this is in 1856. Um, that's how uh, bad the tension had gotten to where you're having physical assaults occur between two very different points of view in Congress rather than debate. Uh, now, Sumner in the North was uh, turned into a martyr for the abolitionist cause. Uh, Brooks, as you see from the political cartoon, is the nameless, faceless evil of the South. Whereas uh, Brooks uh, was praised in the South, many papers calling him to beat Sumner daily. 
And uh, he also received over the next uh, couple of months uh, brand new canes that were shipped to his uh, home in Washington. And uh, with notes saying, you know, in case you need more or, you know, keep those Yankees in line. Um, we laugh about it, but it really is a serious uh, action that does uh, show the tension uh, that had reached such a boiling point in 1856. Uh, the other event where we see uh, the Civil War kind of coming, that violent um, conflict, uh, we see little snippets of it, is what happens in 1859 in Harper's Ver Ferry, Virginia. Uh, Harper's Ferry is a town, is a beautiful town in, in, in Virginia. And um, John Brown is a ardent abolitionist. And some might say uh, somewhat of a fanatic. And he believed that the evil of slavery had uh, been allowed to exist far too long. And in 1859, he and a party of about 19 people uh, raided the federal arsenal in Harper's Ferry, which was pretty chock full of guns and ammunition. And his plan was to distribute those weapons to slaves and basically incite a slave uprising uh, in the South. Now, uh, it didn't work. Uh, federal troops uh, trapped Brown and his followers in the uh, Harpers Ferry Firehouse and uh, <laughs> eventually captured or killed most of the members. Those that weren't captured, including Brown himself, were hung for treason uh, because they had attacked a federal arsenal. Uh, and very much like the Brooks Sumner incident, uh, in the North, John Brown was held as a martyr for fighting against the evil of slavery, whereas Southerners viewed John Brown as nothing more than a Northern terrorist. Um, many of them feared that this is just one example of one abolitionist coming to the South and trying to incite slave rebellions. There's going to be more. So this is where the trust between the two regions really starts to break down. Okay, so uh, what I'd like you to do now is uh, to pause the video, please. And for the next couple minutes, uh, don't take too long, maybe take two, three minutes, uh, review with someone near or next to you uh, the main points from all three events, uh, sectionalism, uh, the Brooks Sumner incident, and John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. And then once that's done, no need to share out, just want to have you guys share with each other if we could please start the video in about uh, two to three minutes. Thanks. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about kind of uh, <laughs> an interesting figure in American history uh, who's pictured right there. His name is Congressman David Wilmot, and uh, he is going to introduce a bill in 1846 called the Wilmot Proviso and it talks about uh, what the United States uh, will do with any territory that it gains from the Mexican-American War and remember by 1846 the Mexican-American War had literally just started. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to get down uh, the information that's missing. If our substitute teacher could pause the video right now um, that'd be great and then when you're everybody's ready I'll start up again. Okay, so David Wilmot. Um, this is an analogy that's gross, uh, but it's a good analogy. Um, the issue of slavery had kind of scabbed over. It was still a wound, uh, a very deep wound, but it had scabbed over because you have the gag rule that was put in place in Congress where people weren't allowed to talk about slavery because they knew how divisive it was. Uh, remember, during the Constitutional Convention, they weren't allowed to talk about it. Um, they, it is something everyone knew. It was kind of the elephant in the room that if we started talking about this in any political forum, especially in Congress, uh, it could lead to a disaster. Um, but David Wilmot doesn't care. Um, <laughs> so he is, um, uh, let's be honest, I mean, when we were kids and even, who knows, maybe now, hopefully you don't do it too much. Uh, whenever you get a scab after a couple of days, what do you eventually do? Eh, you pick it. Be honest, everybody does. And if you don't, well, wow, good for you for being perfect. Um, and that's what David Wilmot did is he picked the scab and we know that when you pick a scab it starts bleeding and the more that you pick it it's, it bleeds a lot um, and his proviso uh, basically reopened the issue of slavery because he said uh, in the law or in the bill I should say that he introduced that any territory gained from Mexico during the Mexican-American War should not have any slavery in it. Now that goes right to the Missouri Compromise. It would make it, if the bill was passed and made a law, it would make it unconstitutional. It would basically take the Missouri Compromise and throw it away. And 
you can see how all that land in the West, both North and South, want it for their own interests. The South for agricultural uh, purposes, for cotton. The North for industrial purposes. Um, and what this did is it reopened the issue of slavery, and it went back and forth between the House and the Senate four times. The House passed it, the Senate rejected it, and then repeat four times. And all those times, people are talking more and more and more and more about slavery. To where really, from that point on, after the Mexican-American War ends, and that becomes kind of, okay, we figured that out, slavery is going to be the issue. And as you heard Professor Ayers said, you know, the issue of slavery and perspectives on it, uh, it's much easier to communicate now. You have a much larger voting population, albeit all white males. Uh, you have the telegraph. You have expanded uh, communication through newspapers and magazines where ideas are shared. And uh, what we see uh, in the presidential elections that follow James Polk's presidency is the kind of shifting nature of political parties. Um, by 1856, we have the new Republican Party, uh, which we're going to talk about, as I said, in more detail on Thursday and Friday. So, so there he is, David Wilmot, America's scab picker. Um, what we're going to do now, though, is talk about one of the events that immediately preceded uh, the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and that is the Compromise of 1850. So uh, if our substitute teacher could please pause the video to let people uh, have a chance to get down uh, the information here, uh, you can go ahead and unpause it when everyone's ready. Okay, so the Compromise of 1850 uh, is where Henry Clay comes to the rescue again. Uh, the issue of slavery has been talked about for some time, thanks to David Wilmot, and both North and South can already feel that whatever comes out of the Mexican-American War, they're going to end up fighting over in some way, shape, or form. And uh, so when the Mexican-American War ends, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is signed, everything that you see basically you know, in western Texas, in that kind of orangish uh, Utah and New Mexico territory, and then of course California, uh, was ceded to the United States from Mexico at the end of the war. Um, now, find the state of Missouri and look at its southern border. And if you trace it uh, on the top of the Indian Territory, the top of Texas, all the way uh, across into California, what it does is that Missouri Compromise Line takes that territory and splits it in two. Okay. The big problem with that is, is that California wants to join the Union in 1850 as a free state, not as two, one free and uh, one slave state, but as one free state. So that really throws things for a loop. The North obviously would love the prospect of getting California for our port, our, our harbors, our ports, possible trade with uh, the Pacific. Obviously, the rich farmland and uh, minerals uh, deposits that are in the very diverse uh, soil of California. So suddenly, everyone's clamoring for war again. And once again, Henry Clay comes to the rescue uh, 30 years later. I'm sure he was like, hey, well, it worked 30 years ago. Let's, let's try it again. So as with all compromise, everybody walks away from the table feeling somewhat unsatisfied. So again, they avoid the Civil War through political compromise. California becomes a free state. The Utah, and the Utah and New Mexico territory are going to vote about slavery, and that's something called popular sovereignty, which we're going to cover here shortly. So the North gets California. Popular sovereignty is going to determine the territories. What does the South get? Well, what the South gets is a law that is known as the Fugitive Slave Act. And this is huge because what it meant is that it meant that all slaves who were living in the North, escaped slaves, had to be returned uh, to their masters. It also meant that Southerners could go into the North and at gunpoint basically take people off the streets and back into a state of slavery. Uh, any Northerner that did uh, not help or that did not, uh, or that aided or abetted slaves in escaping, they could be thrown in jail or fined. And that act, the Fugitive Slave Act, creates so much anger um, among uh, many populations in the United States, both North and South and West. And in a moment, we're going to hear uh, kind of where that anger comes from. There were some minor clauses, you know, you couldn't sell slaves in D.C. Okay, it's almost it's symbolic, but important. Texas was given $10 million uh, for giving up some territory 
in uh, the kind of eastern portion of the New Mexico Territory. And uh, another big significance of the uh, Compromise of 1850, other than the fact that it uh, prevented the Civil War from being fought in 1850, is that for the first time, the free states get the numbers advantage uh, over the slave states. So there's more free than slave states, which means more representation in Congress. It means more representation in the Senate. And unlike the Compromise uh, of 1821, also known as the Missouri Compromise, uh, they didn't try and balance it. So that leads to even more tension. So what you're going to hear now is uh, an interesting uh, perspective offered uh, about why the Fugitive Slave Act was so controversial. Uh, so go ahead and give this a watch. By 1850, the government passes an, an important, harsh, strict fugitive slave law, trying to make sure that northern states will send back anyone who escapes from slavery. They accuse northern states of ignoring the law and harboring fugitives and then destroying the slave system or setting out to destroy the slave system. And so in 1850, they make sure that if anyone helps a fugitive from slavery, that person will be liable to be put in jail and fined. So you don't any longer have to be um, an abolitionist to be subject to the punishment of the law because they also provide that this law says if you're asked to help capture a fugitive, you must. You can't be neutral. You can't stand by and, and think this is a terrible thing, but I don't want to be involved. If you don't help capture that person, you could be fined and sent to jail for six months. I mean, it's, it's a serious offense. This is an affront to liberty on the part of everyone in the North. You know, and they, even people who are lukewarm about slavery who think, well, it's traditional, it's you know, terrible, but there's nothing we can do about it, now find themselves potentially subject to this law. And that really changes anti-slavery sentiment in the North. So as you can see, uh, after the Compromise of 1850, this is where we really see the North and the South uh, begin to split from one another pretty severely. Uh, one of the ideas that was uh, thrust out there to try and prevent um, a split, an eventual civil war, was this idea of popular sovereignty. It's a very American, just a very practical idea, which is, okay, let's give the residents of the territory uh, a chance to vote on whether or not they should have slavery. So what you want to do is you want to get this down, if our substitute teacher could uh, pause the video at this point, uh, I'll allow people to get this stuff down, and then we'll talk about uh, popular sovereignty and deleting cancels. Okay, so as I said, um, popular sovereignty is this idea that was suggested, came out of the Compromise of 1850. It becomes a very popular uh, solution to the issue of slavery with many Americans. And where it's basically like, look, like, you know, have people go into the territory, and once the territory... Uh, becomes populous enough to where it can apply for statehood, let them have a referendum, and they'll vote on it. Are we going to be a free? Are we going to be a slave uh, state? Why the Compromise of 1850 is so important is because when California came in as a free state and popular sovereignty was introduced in the Utah and New Mexico territories, it basically meant the Missouri Compromise line didn't exist anymore. Okay, Because if you're going to vote on slavery, the line doesn't matter. California is a free state, the line doesn't matter. So that's something to, to remember as we kind of move ahead in our conversation here. So the first place they test it is in the Kansas-Nebraska uh, territory. And uh, Kansas, of the two territories, uh, or of the territory, is the most populous and is ready to apply uh, for statehood. Um, and, okay, let's have a vote. There's only one problem. The North wants the territory, the South wants the territory. So what you have is Northerners and Southerners basically packing up shop, moving into Kansas to try and sway the vote one way or the other. And what you have in Kansas, excuse me, 
is you have the Civil War being fought in 1856. You have towns that are aligning themselves as a pro-slave or an abolitionist or free town. And they are literally having pitched battles against each other. Um, if any of you decide to do uh, your iMovie documentary project on the Civil War and you just do a random image search on Google, be wary because some of the images you're going to see were images of basically Americans fighting each other as early as 1856. I mean, the Kansas-Nebraska Act is passed in 1854 that says, okay, we're going to give this a try and try this popular sovereignty idea. But it turns out to be just a bloody mess to where you have Northerners and Southerners you know, going to war with each other from town to town. Um, so if you've gotten to the point now where the territories uh, can vote on either becoming a slave state or a free state, it, it shows you how the tension has really escalated up to this point. Now, there is a Supreme Court case that you guys need to be familiar with uh, around this time, and that is uh, Scott versus Sanford, or the Dred Scott decision of uh, 1857. So go ahead and get uh, this information down if our substitute teacher could please pause the video at this point. All right, so this is the situation. Um, the situation is that Dred Scott is a former slave uh, who is brought by his master uh, from a slave state, Missouri, into free territory, Wisconsin, and then eventually a free state, Illinois. Now, Dredd didn't escape. He and his family traveled with his master from basically slave state to free territory to free state. At that point, when they were in Illinois, Dredd and his family basically said, okay, you willingly took me into this territory, therefore I'm a free man. And his master said, no, you're not. You're still my property. So the court uh, case uh, is heard in a number of the lower courts. And up until, up, uh, right up until 1857, it was finally heard by the Supreme Court of the United States. And this is what they found. They found that even though Dred Scott's master had taken him willingly into free territory, into Illinois, that it didn't matter. Dred Scott could not legally bring the court case or his court case to the Supreme Court because he was not a citizen of the United States. He was a slave. Slaves do not have the rights of a citizen. The court also upheld the decision 7-2 in favor of Sanford, the master of Scott and his family. They said the Missouri Compromise is unconstitutional. Okay. Popular sovereignty is unconstitutional. This whole concept of free versus slave, slave state is unconstitutional. We, Congress, has no right to forbid slavery in any part of the country because slaves, and this is really despicable to say, uh, but uh, under the law at that time in 1857, slaves were not considered people. They were considered property. So you can imagine how elated the South was to hear the Supreme Court decision. It meant they could take them, their slaves wherever they wanted. Whereas the North, who had spent all this time building up what is known as free territory, became a safe haven for slaves escaping into the North. Now they had to escape into Canada thanks to the Fugitive Slave Act. But now the tension is rising to the point where the North feels that the South is infringing on its way of life. Very much like the South felt in many ways, the North was infringing on their way of life. All right, so last slide, guys. Uh, of all the events we've talked about in this very short virtual lecture, um, there's one that basically causes the United States to fall off a cliff. Uh, it's the straw that broke the camel's back, and that is the election of 1860. You may recall that I mentioned that uh, the new Republican Party, so these aren't the Democratic Republicans under Jefferson, but a new, a very liberal uh, Republican Party uh, certainly much more liberal than it is now, um, was formed. And what makes it um, significant is that it is the first uh, anti-slavery party formed in uh, American history, at least on the large scale. There are examples of, you know, kind of pro-abolitionist parties, but really the Republicans, part of their platform was stopping the spread of slavery. Now that's something that's important to also note. 
many Republicans, known as radical Republicans, wanted slavery to be abolished completely, but all Republicans, or at least ones that weren't considered radical, believed that slavery should not spread. They didn't necessarily mean that slavery should stop existing in the South. And an example of this kind of argument, or the platform of the Republican Party in the 1850s and 60s, is seen in a senatorial race uh, in Illinois between uh, Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas. Now, both of these candidates could not be more um, opposite from one another. Uh, one of them was six foot four, one of them was five foot five. Um, and they are going to debate uh, over the course of uh, seven debates held around the state of Illinois about how we are going to solve this issue of slavery. So if our substitute teacher could pause the video right now, that would be great. And then we'll wrap things up after that. Okay, so now that you've gotten a chance to get all of this down, let me walk you through what happens. Uh, so the Lincoln-Douglas debates are an example of the two primary arguments that were used in the North uh, to deal with the issue of slavery. Uh, both of these arguments are very conservative and, in Lincoln's case, a very moderate argument. They're not the radical abolitionism of John Brown or, you know, or Frederick Douglass. Um, Stephen Douglas believes that the way that you figure slavery out is you leave slavery where it is, but the rest of the territory that we added, whether it was with the treaty with Great Britain or the land that we got from Mexico, is determine slave free through popular sovereignty. Vote on it. Lincoln, however, took uh, a more moderate view. Now, this is Abraham Lincoln, and we're going to talk about Lincoln and his views on slavery because, you know, I think you guys are going to be surprised at some of the early stances that he takes. Lincoln says in 1858, when he's running for the Senate seat, he says, listen, slavery is an ancient institution. Our country is industrializing and modernizing, and we need to leave slavery in the past. So, he believes that slavery should be limited to just the southern states as they stand right now in 1858. But Lincoln is completely against the expansion of slavery into the western territories. So it's definitely a pro-abolitionist argument. It's not a fully abolitionist argument because he's saying let slavery stay in the south. But Lincoln at the time felt this is the only way that the country is going to be able to prevent a civil war from happening. But by then it's too late. Lincoln actually loses um, the uh, senatorial race in 1858, which is kind of hard to believe that Abraham Lincoln could lose a, an election. But he ran again, this time for president in 1860. And what you see uh, is that there are four candidates, Lincoln from the uh, very pro-abolitionist uh, Republican Party, Stephen Douglas from the Northern Democratic Party, uh, who believed popular sovereignty was the way around this issue, uh, John C. Breckinridge, who was uh, uh, part of the Southern Democratic Party, the Democratic Party had split in two, who was obviously for keeping slavery as it was, and then John Bell of the Constitutional Union Party, which no, their number one platform was, you know, let's figure out our differences, but let's just keep the country together somehow. Now, Lincoln won the election. He won the election of 1860 with only 40% of the popular vote. And what's even more telling is that of all the southern states, not a single one had his name on the ballot. I want you guys to think about that for a second. Okay? I want you to imagine that in November, when people vote, and they open up their voting ballot, and they see that one candidate has been left off completely from a major party. That's what happened in the South. Lincoln wasn't even put on the ballot. And so as you can expect, almost all the southern states voted for Breckinridge. Whereas Abraham Lincoln carried most of the northern states, some of the western states, and Douglas and Bell respectively carried less. But the message that it sent to Southerners is that here you have this man who has a very moderate position on slavery, but is from a party that is an anti-slavery party. He is now the president of the United States. And this is the same guy they didn't even put on the ballot in the South. And so at this point, Southerners believe they've lost all voice in government. And right after the election, about a month after, on December 20th, South Carolina was the first state to secede or leave from the Union starting the Civil War. So this is kind of where we're going to stop. And as I said, we're going to go into more depth on some of these causes later. Uh, but really, 
next week our focus is going to be on arguably our greatest president. And there he is, a newly elected Abraham Lincoln in 1860. Um, and uh, I think you guys are going to find that the conversation about uh, Lincoln is one that is one of the more interesting that we're going to have all year. All right, so, <laughs> excuse me. So that's it. Um, if you could please just hang on to your lecture notes. Don't forget chapter 14 are due on Thursday and or Friday, depending on what day you have the class. And, of course, please, please bring your laptops uh, tomorrow on Thursday and or Friday. All right, so the rest of the period, you guys are welcome to talk with each other. Uh, you know, just be good like I know you guys will. Uh, or you can work on uh, anything else you need to work on, like your chapter 14 notes. Um, okay, so anyway, uh, I'll see you guys on Thursday. I'll be back by then. Uh, and, of course, as always, may the force be with you all. Bye.